Do you like beef that is ethically and naturally pasture raised? 100% grass fed, grain finished, hormone and antibiotic free, American and Montana produced from a family run ranch? If so, how do you know that's what you purchased? Today, we discuss labels, health choices, and fake foods. Welcome to Hash Knife Hangouts. I'm Kalen. My co host and father is Brandon. If you enjoy what we provide on this channel, take a moment, hit the like and subscribe button. Uh, today, it's going to be a long one, folks. That's why we do it only once a month. We got 10 episodes after this for 2023, but today, fake foods, labeling, health choices, and ethics. Buckle in because it's going to be a long one. Discussions like today are the very reasons why we decided to change these episodes to once a month. Just like I said, without a time limit. That's the important thing. So this might be a while. Why? Because we have a feeling that it's going to be a long one overall because of the over the, the context of the situation, the, the comments, the book we read, which was almost 300 pages. Uh, these three big items on the docket for discussion are going to be labels, plant-based meats, and ethics surrounding your food. Originally, I never considered the ethical piece, but I recently read something that made me think otherwise. Uh, first, labels. Dad and I are both uh, finishing the same book. I finished it a while ago. I think he just did uh, uh, about a week ago, uh, which you can find below in the description titled Real Food, Fake Food by Larry Olmsted. Interesting read and uh, good insights to some things I'd never really thought nor cared about until now. Larry Olmsted provided four reoccurring themes throughout the book which is what uh, we're covering today. And for the first part, we'll go over generational inclusion, wording or labeling, farm to table or real food. And then the fourth one is mass production or the industrialization of food. Again, these are the things Mr. Olmsted illustrated through his analysis of food when discussing labels and real foods in his book, Real Food, Fake Food. And I decided we'd uh, dive into them. So first, generational. Olmsted illustrated four industries that incorporated and used the generational and community model. He showed us in Parmesan and olive oil making in Italy, wine production in France, and then cheeses in Switzerland. The book seems to continue to come back to quality producers who oftentimes tend to be family centered. The Parma cheesemaker and community was based on family and generational ties to that particular style of cheese making. The only change was he traded a rooster's crow in the morning for his more modern alarm clock to begin the day. The day. Uh, co-ops in France where wines are produced had three to four generations working in the same shop, bottling and creating top of the line wines. Very similar to us. Italy again had oil production with olives and Olmsted finally showed cheese production in Switzerland again, where a family knew nothing about, uh, term organic because why? Well, uh, it's simple. It's the way they had always done it. Uh, organic then was the natural only way to produce the quality cheeses they did. Kobe beef, not family centered, but rather breed tradition and generationally tied, did the same to produce the quality cuts people covet. They do it, uh, they, they do it the way they do it because to meet their quality expectation, it is simply the way they have always done it. And they're not going to change it unless they find a better way. I found it profound that when many U.S. beef producers centered around the same thing, we often fight to make the greatest quality products that families and smaller businesses also do half a global way. Uh, second, wording and labeling without about food. The author further showed the importance of labels with foods. He explained how regional labels were once used to produce original designators and identifiers to who? The consumers. Chardonnay, Burgundy, Kobe beef, Parmigiano Reggiano were all original protect protection policies. And I hope I got that Italian right. For consumers so they could identify precisely where the food originated. The use of the same names with California wines, like California Chardonnay, California Burgundy, so on and so forth, Kobe-inspired beef, Parma-like cheeses, have tainted the actual meaning and now confuse consumers rather than assist them in understanding the product. More modern descriptors like organic, 100% grass-fed, 100% beef and hot dogs, and the like are now Wild West of sorts when it comes to labeling where producers operating in the legal, moral, and regulatory gray area take full advantage of misunderstandings and unknowns from a consumer's point of view. Labels such as organic have no real standing. Much like a newer form of greenwashing, there's no actual legal means or grade in which a producer can use the information to truly inform the consumer. Another example is beef. It may be natural, but that refers to the processing of the meat and not the way in which the living animal was raised prior to butchering. These people have tugged at consumer heartstrings with no regard or obligation to facts. 
The question may rise, why does the FDA not address this issue? Well, it tends to focus on reactionary things that are important health-wise like E. coli outbreaks, but that does little to pro little for proactive prevention. Quality producers are not the misleading ones, don't get me wrong. It is the promoters of major corporations that attempt to make penny stretch while maximizing revenue. This may also lead to question of cool or country of origin labeling, which we've discussed before. Why does uh, why does beef in the U.S. not have cool? The fact that the United States has vehemently pushed against European protection designation of origin, PDO for short, may be why we have had such difficult times obtaining such an important part of the labeling process for us here at home. Think Kraft cheese with its stretch of claiming Parmesan cheese when it is made in a factory in the U.S. and not in Italy among a cohesive community rife in traditional ways and procedures to the production process. Those are the two points. Third, <laughs> mass production of food, higher efficiency of production. Like with what we see in our latest beef production numbers last year of 21.5% of the world's production does not always mean quality food. Despite that, people may ask, where's all the grass-fed beef? Well, if you're looking for grass-fed and finished beef, that is not nearly as efficient and takes much more land, things we continuously run out of more and more. If you want the U.S. to continue to produce the most amount of beef in the world, then we have to maintain processes where grass-fed and finished beef is a rarity. Mass production of foods also leads to replications of mass-produced items that industries can easily create but taste fake to the producer. Or they may taste just fine, which leaves another problem. The item is likely so rare you've never, you have likely never had the real stuff. Two examples Olmsted shared in his book are balsamic vinegar and truffle oil. Renowned chefs like Gordon Ramsay do not even cook with truffle oil because it is so rare that they simply count the product before them as counterfeit and refuse to use the ingredient in their high quality dishes, which is amazing. It, it really surprises you. It's easy to wash the real items out, of, out when factories can simply create an easy, cheap, chemically made fake that will overload the market. This also leads to lower quality with things like olive oil. Instead of picking only the proper olives, some companies pick those that are not ripe enough, overripe, or have fallen on the ground. Instead of picking just the right items, they allow for lower quality ones to enter the production and therefore reduce the quality of the oil at the end of the line. It's fine for the producer in this regard because it ultimately makes more product, but the but hurts the consumer. American forms of Parmesan are the same. Some have fillers as high as 7.8% that are edible, but not always good for your body. How does a producer even get past the Parmesan labeling in the first place if we're talking PDO? by making variants that sound the same as the real deal, but spell different or have an added suffix. In that case, outright lies and half truths are used to disguise the real, or excuse me, the fake stuff from the real. The book's final point and fourth point, farm to table and real food concepts. He really closed it up at the conclusion with this, but quality food and ultimately quality health begins with real foods that create better dishing, better tasting dishes and even greater positive impacts to your body. True Parmesan is difficult to come across to begin because it is so rare. Why is this? Because Parmesan is made in a specific part of the world. It is warehoused and stored a certain way. And like any and and like any warehouse products, there's inevitable loss through spoilage. It just happens. However, it is not wasteful in the process. Any waste is provided to local pigs who ultimately become some of the best meat in the world in the name of prosciutto. In Italy, locals often know where exactly their food originates when they eat a pizza. This is something Americans often comment on after visiting the nation. What brings that statement? The exquisite flavors and great eating experiences because the real foods taste better than the manufactured ones. Other industries like the sushi world may result in people sitting on a couch all day in recovery where they say they simply had, quote, bad tuna. Unfortunately, it's probably not the case at all. they likely had a filler fish that was counterfeit and the producer never knew because the sushi restaurant never knew. Just like Kobe beef, food is counterfeited all the time to either maximize profits or bamboozle others as a way to make money the old school con artist way, just through food. The, art, the author shared two stories that were interest to me when it came to the real foods. One was a Florida grill where sandwiches are known to be top quality. The owner and founder always attributes it to the fact that he knows exactly where he's getting his fish locally and how it is harvested every day prior to cooking. His next story was from South America when he had an experience, an amazing crab dinner before and decided to return years later with his wife to share it. When asking for the meal, the couple was informed that it was unavailable that night. 
However, seeing the saddened response, the waiter said he would go do and see what he could. Less than an hour later, the meal originally refused was in front of them because the food needed was only down the street at the local fish market. The real foods were the true farm-to-table experiences that were around far before the farm-to-table concept became a craze in the United States. He concluded with the fact that true quality food has ripple effects through your life, and I could not agree more. If you find a way to buy as local and quality centered as possible, your body, health, and taste buds will thank you. The second subject for discussion is plant-based meats. <laughs> my nemesis. I've made it clear my position on this stuff, and I'll not <laughs> hold back either. To get in, instead, I have come armed with some information that I have previously, more information than I have previously. On January 19th of this year, of 2023, Bloomberg Magazine provided a good article on the faux meat industry is how they put it. I wish I had a way of telling the future because I would have been better about timing this discussion with that article re release rather than doing it a couple months later, but oh well, you win some and you lose some. When fake meat began its marketing the public and seeking consumer support, it began with two main attack points. Minimize greenhouse gases by reducing the livestock needed to produce meats, and it would help solve common diseases we see in heart disease, diabetes, cancer, to name a few. The original goal excuse me, the ultimate goal was to give up the meat, but not the texture, feel, taste, or sustaining qualities already found in meats like beef. What should also be noted is this canon of fake meat was solely directed at the beef industry. The goal and the beef industry moved to the pork industry, then finished with the poultry industry. If you think I'm providing conspiracy theory, check out some of the quotes provided in the Bloomberg article, which is cited in the description below. I promise you it's there. From the beginning ranchers, and food producers stated this was a bad bad idea for many reasons. First and foremost, health. Next, the continued monopoly possibility of foods, concerns for creating food rather than raising it. Big difference there. And finally, the fact that a well-balanced ba diet for nutrients, vitamins, and other overall well-being means a maintaining a healthy intake of meat and plants, not just plants. Some have nutrients, the others did not, and vice versa. After nearly four years, the fake meat industry is beginning to realize this will probably not happen like originally planned, but there are a few who continue to push for the end goal. The first phase was the end to end the beef industry by 2024, then move on to others. Here we are in early 2023, and the beef industry is not going anywhere. Does it need improvements in restructuring? Yes, but it's still well and good because people need beef in their diets. Now, out of curiosity... Who were some of the biggest supporters and investors in food like this? Well, first, some celebrities. The Humane Society of the United States, not surprising, but McDonald's. And you guessed it, Tyson Foods. Initially, fake meat got some traction, especially during the weird pandemic phase. But in 2022, as the U.S. essentially reopened all the doors that survived through the tumultuous political and economic policies, the sales of fake meat fell by 14%. This is compared to the consistent increase of beef over the last few years, despite the higher prices in beef. Check out the card above. When it comes to the health aspect of fake meat on executives, blame the real meat industry on false information, saying that many of us suggest that it is full of chem chemicals and somehow unhealthy. To that, many of us say, prove it. Prove, prove that it is not better for you or that it is. Prove the things added are better than meat. Prove that it is not unhealthy for a consumer. Prove that it will drastically change lives and the world. They failed to do that. In 2020, 50% of the American population thought fake meat was healthy. Now it's 38%. Regardless, the fake meat is ultra processed, and that is probably the biggest argument against it if we're being completely honest. There are two main off-putting characteristics and fake meat as well which we can also share our personal experiences. And I'll make sure that there's a link to that as well. We did that on fake meat. <clears throat> a common complaint by consumers is the unpleasant smell, both before and after cooking the plant-based meats. The second is the cost. If you look at our fake meat video where we try the meats ourselves, the cost comparison at the end and shows the vast difference between two brands of meat and locally purchased burger meat, the cost is nearly four times more with the fake meat. So it is neither appealing nor cost-effective to consume plant-based meats. Finally, meat is unlike milk. It is not a da daily staple in cooking, baking, or drinking things. You do not require it in pastas, baked goods, or your morning coffee. Alt milk, or alternate milk, took off because it was a huge game-changer for those who cannot consume normal dairy milk. 
but would like to continue many creamy pastas, eat cakes, cookies, and have a latte for breakfast on the go to work. Beef is not like that by any means. You need beef to eat beef. There are no, there are sometimes when substituting for chicken is better, but more often than not, you don't, you won't be ordering a pork or chicken burger when beef is the common go-to. The volume simply isn't there to require a drastic alternative to beef. Why is that? Because the population that currently consumes it in the United States is 5%, which was those who did not eat meat to begin with four years ago. What does it do? It gives those very people that 5% an option to enjoy a burger alongside friends at a bar while maintaining their own vegetarian or vegan lifestyle. It benefits restaurants more than it does consumers and hence why McDonald's decided to invest early. Since plant-based meats seem to be a bust for now, what does the future have in store for us? Apparently, cellular meat. Meat where cells of living livestock are grown in a lab to create cuts of meat. If this is the case, do you think I'm going to eat it? <laughs> Not a chance. I already made my opinion clear on anything produced in a lab and processed <clears throat> long ago. So from here, I digress to the final subject. To continue today's episode monologue, I rounded it all out with a third related topic, ethics. Why is it important for food? Honestly, many reasons. So this is why I wrap it up with ethics. I am currently taking a class on law and ethics. Surprisingly enough, I found a chapter introduction that really caught my eye. The law is what we must do. Ethics is what we should do. So the question, is it ethical to exploit the intention of children to manipulate parents into buying things? Thinking about Kool-Aid, popsicles, cereals. Is it ethical to input sugars and high fats into foods through processing to make them more addicting to consumers? Currently, 13% of people over 50 are touted as being addicted to ultra-processed and sugar-added foods. If you think we have an issue with beef, it's not there. It's with the ultra-processing. Is it ethical to place pictures of products or items on labels of food that have no relationship to the item purchased or marketed? These are quick questions common ethics ask, and they are some of the key arguments against processed, processed foods in general. I see them as not only a part of the discussion, but a minor yet key item of discussion because without ethics in food production and sales, at what point are we supposed to trust our food? That is where real food comes into play against fakes or frauds. That is where labels play a key part, and that is why accurate labels are even more important so that you and your loved ones know what you are eating and from where it originated and what may or may not have been added into an into it during the preparation process. Food is more than something you consume to sustain your body. There are in industries that survive off of how well they sell that thing to you, the consumer. Keep that in mind next time you carefully look over a label that may not be 100% factual. Keep that in mind when you question something on your plate. Keep that in mind when considering ethics, nutrition, and well being when searching the aisles at your local grocery store shop carefully my friends shop carefully i have 15 pages of notes about three items outlined the labeling the labeling from real food fake food fake meat and the ethics that i already outlined above in the last 18 minutes instead of reading quotes and all the ideas i wrote down i'll kick it over to dad for his take and we'll reference them throughout the discussion with that i turn it over to him <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks Thanks for throwing that hot potato my way. I can't talk as long as you can. Um, you know, I started into that book. Uh, it was a real eye opener. It made me go and start looking at labels and in the cupboard. You know, uh, yeah. the olive oil was a big one. You know, and I love cheese. Huge one. Yeah. So you know, and there's some places that that he actually said were a good spots to to buy. You know the highest chance of getting what you're supposed to be getting. Right. And, uh, you know, I like, I love cheeses. I just love cheese. And it makes me kind of wonder at times whether I've ever had real cheese, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you, you have to wonder about that because there's only a couple of ingredients in real cheese. But when you look at a label on some of the cheeses that are available, there's all kinds of stuff in there. It mostly are preservatives. Uh, but you know, cheese you know you everybody's had cheese maybe a block of cheese and go moldy a little bit on the outside right. what do you do you cut it off cut it off just yeah. cut it off and keep going i mean it's uh that's how that's how cheese ages it gets a rind on it um uh anyway i got about halfway through the introduction of that book and i got pissed 
you know, I mean, it was like, here we are trying to do the right thing, yet we are also consumers that are being, you know, screwed out of, uh, you know, a a product that we think is one thing when it's really not. And and there's no doubt a lot of this stuff is because anytime you buy it, if it's got a package on it or a jar around it, you know, there's a really good high probability uh, reading his book. And he only touched on uh, a few items. I mean, it makes you wonder what else is in your cupboard that right. is, you know, you know, when they're talking about, you know, less than 10% of a, a particular cheese that's supposed to be Parmesan cheese, and less than 10% of that is actually Parmesan cheese, or yeah. some of it is none of it is Parmesan yeah. cheese. Well, it goes back to the labeling. They just changed the yeah. name to make it sound similar. So right. nobody who really understands will just be like, oh, yeah, Parmesan, go grab it. Right. Well, and when, you know, you, and there's been a lot of lawsuits over the, over some of these issues between, um, you know, some of the actual producers and, right. and the uh, uh, areas in, in, like, say, Roquefort. Uh, cheese. Not that I, I'm a fan of Roquefort cheese, but hell, how do I know? Maybe yeah. I've never had real Roquefort cheese, you know. And it's, maybe somebody just changed the, you know, the the labeling to sound right. similar, and they just right because it's it's really only grown uh, or produced in a very specific place in in uh, France because the conditions are right in the caves where right. you know there's there's mold spores that create the taste, and that's the only place in the world that it's done well. Okay, let's duplicate that and then call it Roquefort and spell it different or Roquefort like processing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was, I mean, all of those things are are very indicative and it and you know that to a point too, because you've seen yeah. some of these things that are uh, you know, they 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 capitalize on a name, but then say similar or or like or processed like or packaged as or whatever, you know, and, yeah. and so you know that that's happened. And you're looking at it, and you there's a little buyer beware there. Maybe maybe we're just a little bit more, um, maybe Palace. tuned up to that possibility that that could happen because we've seen it in our industry, you maybe. know. So well, and that I think the biggest thing that the hit home with me was like the Kobe beef because oh, yeah. being in the beef sector, like we're like yeah okay Kobe beef, but we see Kobe all over the place on the sure. shelves and in menus, and they said I think it was in the book I thought he said like 52 pounds a year is actually imported to the United States. And never for retail sale. It's always through uh like a restaurant. Yeah. Higher higher yes, very limited supply. So you, like, you probably wow. have somebody like uh Ramsey Gordon Ramsey, he has I think two or three restaurants in the United States. I would imagine one of those restaurants probably gets ten pounds a year, right? Yeah. It, it let's could. just assume it's gonna be a high end restaurant like that. Right. Well, that means another 43 pounds, 42 pounds is going to go to other restaurants. And that's all there is. Everything else is Kobe like. It's not actually Kobe. It's just people, like you said, the like or processed like or raised Kobe raised beef and stuff like that. Like that's how they get with it. Well, what does that mean? That means it's only in certain pastures and raised like that. Or Uh, they're using the genetics. They've somehow obtained the genetics and they're, they're raising similar genetic right beef in the united states but it's not actual kobe <laughs> right or <laughs> or they were they were there who god knows how they are going to justify what, how they label or call something i mean it's the same thing as a is the uh the lawsuit that was described in the in the book about hot dogs yeah and it says 100% beef hot dogs well it doesn't mean that the the hot dog is 100% beef what it right. means is the beef that was in it is 100% beef and yeah. it could be, you know, 0.1% beef in this hot dog, but that beef is 100%. So the mislabeling and the and the the intention behind the labeling and what they really mean are completely fraudulent uh, right. in, in in their in their approach to get you to buy something. And and well, then you go with the ethics again. It goes well. It goes to my point. Not only the ethics, but the other point too of you're. you're you're pulling at people's heartstrings in a right. sense where you're like, oh, I want to get a beef hot dog, right? But it's not just beef in there. There's, you know, there's intestines and stuff that's been ground up, I'm sure. And, mm-hmm. and they're, they're throwing everything. Cause that's what hot dogs are. They're just a reject that's been encased in some sort of, um, uh, hot dog encapsulating cellophane, essentially <laughs> like well, edible cellophane, but yeah, it's like, it's like salami only smaller, right? Or, exactly. or bologna only smaller. Yeah. But you've still got pork and chicken and oh, yeah, everything. I'm sure you got some fish and stuff in there too, but it's just, Good you food. can, 
you you have anything in there and but people think oh i'm supporting the beef industry if i get a beef hot dog and that's not always the case it's just right. whatever's in there is beef <laughs> well when i was a kid there's uh you know frozen foods were really starting to come out like tv dinners yeah you know and i can remember getting a i was like i don't know mrs paul's or something like that uh mm-hmm. fish fillet and they were they oh. were square oh yeah and so we tried them one time and my dad took a bite of that and he goes yeah it tastes like sawdust so we always joked that you know these fish sticks were just sawdust sticks how wrong were we (laughs) (laughs) probably not right because they're found because they're finding cellulose or sawdust in a lot of these products uh, especially the cheeses the uh the other thing was um i don't think did you read the bloomberg article i did not i didn't see that it was interesting because a lot of people hit it hard uh, when it came out in uh, mid to late January. And I think anybody who's really interested in it, they should check out that that uh, link to the article below. But it it really went over. It, I thought it did a good job of hitting both sides, honestly. It, did, it was pretty objective for the most part. Um, and it explained what the executives were intending to do. Uh, they wanted to take over the beef industry and then, like I said, go to, for pork and chicken afterwards, which they fully admitted. Those executives of those corporations, Beyond Meat, um, was the other one we had. Uh, fake, no, it wasn't. It was uh, Plant. Now there's a couple, Beyond Meat, and there was one other that we had recently. Yeah. Oh, um... I forgot. Sorry, folks. But uh, anyway, there's a couple of well-known ones, and I'll probably remember it in a little bit, but uh they they really did say you know this is our intention is we we want to get rid of and it it goes back to kind of like the humane society we want to get rid of harming animals that's kind of like their the the big drum they heart string that they pull the drum they beat is we don't want to hurt animals and also we want to fight greenhouse gases well well, you want to talk about that alone there's an organization and i'm sure they do some good work here and there the humane society of the united states when I, yeah. my private por- or former life, we used to confiscate animals that were illegally taken and they were auctioned. And I, I did some of the auctioneering on that. Not that I'm an auctioneer, it was poor, right. but we did that. And there was almost always a representative locally here from the Humane Society of the United States wanted to make sure that we were yeah. doing this with some kind of decorum. Here's the, here's when you look at the Humane Society of the United States, what facilities do they have? for taking care of animals that are displaced say floods in the south we've seen that a lot hurricanes floods they, they don't they coordinate they don't. for somebody else to do it yes yeah they they collect money oh yeah they'll collect a lot of money for them and they are basically a finger pointer saying yeah th- that person or those that group over there will take them or they'll take this them is a there. humane society suggested or humane society certified right. they're not actually a, a a vendor to an extent but they make it look like on their commercials right. that they are rescuing and saving and housing yeah. and and taking care of it's a complete false premise and and people right. buy into that what meanwhile how much of their money is going to uh private people i don't know maybe it's not really. maybe it's not maybe I, it i've seen some rescue places that look worse because the animals can't get enough feed because right. there's just too many of them right so and maybe it is maybe maybe they're 100 percent above board but still their advertising practices are misleading it's yeah. not them you know so i mean you have that at that level uh you know as, as a side note outside of our food but look at what what goes on with the marketing in the people's emotional terrorism is sometimes what I call it, you know, is it, Oh, we're going to make these people feel like this so that they'll be happy to give up their money and think they're doing something good. Um, you know, people want to buy Kobe beef. Right. I'd like to taste Kobe beef. Yeah. I'm, I'm way interested. I know the chances of me doing that are probably less than zero. I, I know now that, if I'm ever going to try Kobe beef, I won't do it unless I'm in Japan. And even then, and even then you have to be careful yeah. because you have all of the uh, offshoots or the, the Wagyu. And that's more likely what you're getting is some, some form of Wagyu, which yeah. I'm fine. I've had what I believe was Wagyu, but you know what? I've, you question a whole lot after reading this book, don't you? You sure do. <laughs> you know, and 
and I've had some really good tasting t- tasting steaks uh, outside of um, you know home in a in a restaurant. Some fabulous tasting stuff, but it could have been just as easily Angus, right? It could have been just as easily just prepared uh, well, Hereford or something that was well fed, well finished, and um, you know the preparation is is as important as the raising of it really for a, 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 a good taste. You can ruin a good piece of meat. You right. Cook that thing till it's, you know, uh look like boot leather. It doesn't matter what it is, it's still not going to taste good at that point. You could completely ruin it with the, the cooking process. Yeah, I just I, a couple of things I wanted to cover with the Bloomberg art Bloomberg article yeah. before we just kind of go through what I I talked about though was um I, I felt like they explained the executives well. Then they explained, you know, how the the beef industry and the meat industry in general has not been supportive of of the fake meat, the faux meat, the plant based proteins, whatever you want to call it. There, and we haven't been. And I I've said not only because it's a, it is an attack on us because mm-hmm. they've explicitly said that, uh, but also because of the way they've they've treated the industry. But also because it, it, it's not. It's not good for you. I have said that from day one. It be, besides the fact that, you know, you're trying to get something that's maybe similar to meat that you are vegetarian or vegan. It is just not good for you. It is bad. And I, I, I cannot stress that enough because looking at all the ingredients on that label, when we did the, when we ate the the fake meat, uh, it was, a, it was absolutely amazing in the worst way possible of how many things were in there. When you get beef, you know, what's in there, there's beef. And then there's, there's a little bit of fat to keep it together. If you're doing a burger, if it's a steak, it's just the steak. That's it. Um, they, you know, they said things like, this was a quote that I really want to put out there. They're doing their very best today to suggest, to suggest that our process is somehow unhealthy or that our products are full of chemicals. These things are not true. And I was like, that's where my point came in. Prove it. Like, yeah. I, I don't know what you're putting into this when you show all these things on your on your uh, label. Like, And this is one of the good things. At least you're labeling it. I hope you're labeling all of it, though, because I don't know what else you're putting in there. And that's where I really had the big issue with that that fake meat story. But um, then they then they said they, they considered it compared to alt milk and why alt milk was different because it's just it's not the same. You can't really do that. And then finally, uh, what's the next potential? It's the cellular meat, which they're using cells from living livestock. So if we were to take, everybody loves ears on our ranch. If you were to take um, a big vial of blood from uh, ears and then you put it into a lab and you slowly developed a, a cow to eat off of that or, or not even really a living cow, but like a hunk of meat, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to take those cells and make a hunk of meat. Then you cut it up. You process it like you would any other hunk of meat off of a slaughtered animal without actually providing any life to the cell. Petri other dish. Than, yeah, it's a petri dish. I was like, that's not much better. Uh, it really isn't. But all right, um, let's uh, let's start from let's start from the top, man. Uh, okay. Uh, the first thing I said was it was a while ago. <laughs> Generational speaking. Um, so this let me start off with the book was introduced to me at work believe it or not and i was um i i was skeptical but i'm very glad that we ended up grabbing it because somebody's like hey you know check it out you know if you're really interested in talking about something you should talk about this so we i did and it turned out to be good generationally speaking though he really focused on cheeses olive oil and um wine he did talk about kobe beef a little bit in the sushi market but those the generation, like I said, with Kobe was more or less tied to the animals, not the people. Um, I'm sure it's probably a close knit community with Kobe beef, but but well, they're the, prote- they're protecting genetics. Yeah, right. That's why really I say what, it's more it's more focused on the animal than it is the people. But the, I I was just amazed that um, he he had talked about how everything was so generationally tied. You know, Parmesan, the part the the cheese maker. You know, he has an obligation to go out and milk his cows every day and collect the milk and take it to the next guy and so on. And that guy takes it and he stores it and everything. And it's just the same way with all the processes and they have generations tied into well, it. Well, and some of those were, uh, what you're talking about there with the cheese is you got, you got a dairy farmer has got cows that are on certain grass, only certain grass Yeah, because that's what they've got, you know, 
and and they're not overgrazing. They are maintaining, so it's sustainable. They milk and they take it right to the the cheese maker. You know, if if they don't do that themselves too, and that the, some of that cheese can only be, you know, are like two hours old. Or the milk I, was say, I thought they said four old. was the max. If I remember, four was right. the max. A lot of them yeah. too, and some of them at an hour old, depending on their proximity. You know how they travel and move it. But you're talking, you know, what were they? I can't remember the exact poundage of of uh, milk because usually milk is not sold in gallons but pounds when you're right. like that. And it was it was surprisingly like a two hundred pounds or something like that was it was surprisingly small batches, but it's what they could handle what they can do physically with their two hands, not through yeah. mechanization. Because I said, they're not using me- uh, mechanisms or, or any of those suction devices that our, right. our U.S. industry uses for dairy. With but you're talking production. five five generation uh, uh, people doing exactly the same thing because it fills that niche what they have in that community. Somebody's got to be the cheesemaker. Who's going to be it? Oh, okay, well, we will. We'll make yeah. the cheese and on my great, great grandkids will still make the cheese because you guys are still milking cows and your great, great grandkids are doing it. And you know what, what are you going to do with this waste? Well, somebody decided they're going to go ahead and raise the hogs. So <laughs> we've got some waste with a, you know, we'll feed it to the hogs and prosciutto ham. I think I've had prosciutto ham, but I have to question what I I've know. Had anything now, know. you know, now uh, you look at anything, you're like, man, did I really actually have that? I always think I'm having prosciutto, but is it actually prosciutto right. or is it prosciutto like? <laughs> don't know, don't know. You know, and so you've got that sustainability in a community that is a closed loop, really. And so, but through trade, which has been going on since, you know, people could walk from one place to another and mm-hmm. had one item that somebody else needed or thought they needed, and you could trade. That's been going on. And they they use what they can u- use, and then the rest they trade. And uh, you know those those processes. The reason why it gets so expensive to do that is you have a larger demand for a same sized production and true yes, and production. I also I agree with that. I think you're right. But I also think the other thing I noticed also was the government regulations. The only thing that's really changed over that time is same process and everything. But now we've got government regulations, which I have no doubt those have increased the price to an extent. Oh, for sure. And then and then, of course, as always, like with us, the animals dictate the timelines as well. It's not always just, oh, I need to go make a block of cheese. No, no, no. When the cow says she's ready to get milked, that's when I get the milk. I don't get to just go out there and milk her all day long. It doesn't work that way. Well, and and the other part of that is, is a cow doesn't just because she's milking, she doesn't do that 365 for the rest of her life. Right. You know, they, they have yeah. to break and then uh, they get rebred at some point, have a calf and become fresh again. So, yeah, you only milk a cow for so long. And I think a lot of people don't really get that. And and, and the details of, of dairy farming, I, I'm i not there. I don't yeah. I don't know. I, I, I have a ton to learn about that. It's not been in our bailiwick because guess what? We're not doing dairy cattle. Don't have to. If I want milk, I go to the guy who's milk it, making milk, right? <laughs> Not that we well, couldn't consumption, but still. There's a couple things. Like I said, I, people, I have 15 pages here, so I'm kind of looking through some of my notes as well. There's one thing I want to talk about, but I'll before we get there, I'll talk about the label too, with the, which pertains to something like this is, you know, be wary of the labels fresh, natural, or organic because they have no legal meaning. Right. You know, just like, Equally suspect are sushi grade and sashimi grade, which are frequently used to suggest higher quality. No such grade exists. So, you know, the labeling is important because you need to know, are you actually getting real Parmesan? But then also, you know, don't fall for the things that make it seem like it's fresh, naturally raised, 100% organic. Like that, there's no quantitative or qualitative way to verify that through legal means I'm kind of segueing off of what I said with government regulation. So be careful. <laughs> well, and the other part of that, which was interesting was I would, I would think that if somebody was going to fraudulently make a product that they would cut the cost of that product because they're using, you know, fake fish, fake cheese, yeah. fake, whatever the production costs are way lower. So they're going to undercut mm-hmm. your real production or real producers and that's not always the case. Sometimes they're even more expensive where they are capitalizing on people thinking, well, 
this is super expensive, so it must be the real stuff. Yeah. And so that happens, which is like, that's the whole reason why they're in it in the first place is they're taking something cheap or subpar and passing it off as something that's real to make a huge profit margin in there. Well, that's just because it's high price doesn't mean it's what it is. Quality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that also kind of goes continue with the generational part and the quality talk uh, briefly jumping over to the wine section. You know, he says uh, it was it was common to see several generations working together with mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, grandchildren and grandparents, all picking grapes together by hand, of course, which is how he finished it. I was like, sometimes like like the Parmesan, the, the old school way is the best way because that the real food. <laughs> like, just well, you, hammering that. you got quality control when right. you're picking something off of a bush. Right. I mean, if you're yeah. only picking the right stuff and you're teaching the little ones. And they've picked something and you pull it out of there and go, no, you know, you're yeah. teaching them what, what to look for. And some of these are like, what, what surprised me is some of the, the uh, methods, the high production, you know, they, you've seen them shake a tree with a, you know, like an apples or, or whatever, when they fall off the tree, cause they're being shaken. They don't do that because you'll get some of the bad ones too. You'll get mostly yeah. bad ones, the ones that are overripe, which then your, your, your olive oil is rancid right off the get the get go it's rotten it is, it is it's worth lamp oil to to actually heat or or, or light up a room so well yeah, it, it, it was surprising also because to to an extent he was talking about some of the wine vineyards in France where true burgundy true chardonnay true champagne comes from and he's saying like some of these plots are only like 40 to 80 acres right. i think of them as being massive like what we see in you know california wine where there's probably what we would see as sections upon sections of right of wine grapes and they're like no it's just small farm plot because and it makes sense because it's all generationally tied of everybody's around the table everybody's picking up everything grabbing the right ones and then then they go administer it and put it to the fermentation tank and then they take it from the fermentation tank then they start to bottle it or uh, barrel it and you know it's a small, truly like a microbrewery type sense, in, but with wines. And that's also why it's more coveted. It's quality controlled, like you're saying. They're not just pulling crap. <laughs> well, what one of the things that surprised me about that is that just because they grow those grapes that year doesn't mean that it is a, called a vintage year. Right. You you could go one year and have a vintage. You might, you might go three or four years and the grapes that are produced because of the rainfall or whatever is not as good. And so they can't be considered a high quality vintage vintage year, yeah. which was. Well, it's kind of like us, you know, we lose, we lose weight on calves because of a drought, right? They, they lose price on the bottles because not the right vintage or not the right quality. So, okay, right. well, we're obviously going to continue to produce, but it's just not going to be as high income as right. what we originally expected. Yep. Very, very yeah. similar tie. <laughs> very similar that way. Except that their 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 wines will last, even the bad ones will last longer than our cattle do. Yeah, <laughs> you know, just throw it on the it. on the bottle or on the shelf for twenty years, and you'll get more from it eventually. Right, right. Uh, here's here's where I wanted to kind of end this part too. It, the generational tie with the uh, with the Swiss family about their their dairy and everything. Um, not only because it's generational, but it it goes back to labeling, and it's also the naivety of what they experienced. Um, but I got two quotes here. One was the first one was today. Many visitors ask if our cheese is organic, but here we never thought of it that way because everything has always been natural. It's the natural way. It's not just the cheese, but everything we eat, the meat, the milk, it's all organic, but it is funny when people ask as if it's special. I think it's the things that aren't organic that need special labels because they are the exceptions. I'm like, boom. That's a huge hit right there. Well, and and I don't think and when I read that too, and I remember thinking that it isn't it isn't because it's another alternative way. It's the only way it's made. Yeah, that's it. This is how you do it. Yeah. No exceptions. What have you What have you done in lieu of the only way that makes it special or different? That's right. when it should be labeled. And I was like, Ooh, that's not that's a concept, a... right? Yeah, <laughs> that's I mean, what that, we need. That, yeah, it's not a concept. I mean, it's 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 there is no other way. The the other was uh they're talking about um labels and antibiotics and stuff like that and goes um this is where the naivety really comes in. The the person that he asked the question to, they go, they they couldn't 
that's not possible. That's not right. Were her responses, no matter how I phrased it, being the question. When I suggested that it would be legal in my country to make and sell uh, hobocost, I think is what it is, made of cows, goats, or even camel's milk, or from any animal fed any food full of antibiotics, growth or hormones, or steroids. So when he's saying, you know, we can make the same product, but so on and so forth, it wasn't, they couldn't understand. Just like what you said, well, this is the only way it's made. Like, how would they understand that there's a different way to do it? Right. it, it I, I thought it was a, a telling thing of how uh, how things can be uh, kind of understood in, in the more wholesome way. <laughs> well, and, and I think that goes to the point of when you when you're handling every small nuance of the production part of that, you know what you have and, and you can, you're going to maximize what you can do with what your own hands can handle. You know, either you gotta you gotta have more hands doing it, but still, why would you change that? Because yeah, your your production costs, you're doing it as cheaply and and inexpensively as you can. And, and look, we're talking about generations. Not only that, uh, was it some of the uh, was it the champagne? Was it the uh, the monk? One of the monks made champagne from uh, from wine, and Maybe. we're talking the 1400s or 14th yeah. century. You know, I mean, we're talking hundreds of years of of uh, uh, some of these processes that are not changed, and they, and and that's where I think some of the government is stepping in 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 Europe, and maybe in a good way, is that they are regulating how it's done, that it can't be varied from the traditional way. Now, when you do that, though, guess what? You have just regulated something that can be now um uh faked or or done right. differently and that's but that doesn't mean that the government regulation caused that it just it just i think exemplifies the ability to have a target market yeah i i don't know if it to an extent i agree and i don't because you've you've not only now permitted that you can do that but as long as there is a as long as there's like any good business Oh, now I can enter the market cheaper and make right. a product and ride the name. You've right. now promoted fakeness to me to an extent. Right. Whether it's intentional or not, you've still done it. You've promoted the the fake or the, yeah. the sub quality. And I think Olmstead was calling that coattailing. Right? Yeah. They're just you're 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 just going off of what somebody else has already done and calling it the same thing but at a lot less and less uh, uh, cost and quality. So, um, yeah, there's, I mean, it, it, it was disturbing to me. And basically because we're not part of it, probably as far from it as you can get is the, the fish industry. Yeah. Which that's where I wanted to go next actually was the, the labeling part. So we're going to give me, yeah. give me time here. Uh, the, the, I'll start with, We'll start with fish, um, because that was that was an important one. Uh, now here's here was I'll, I'll not lie, <laughs> kind of irked me a bit. Um, this is where our argument for country of origin labeling, uh, would actually be. This would be a great counter argument to anybody that disagrees yep. with us. I um, thought the same thing. I was like, dang it, um, <clears throat> because this this particular quote said shipping and country of origin labeling or information is routinely and illegally illegally falsified to cover up poaching and hide fish coming from dangerous farms that are unapproved chemicals and even slave labor. Uh, so you think, you know, blood diamonds and things, this would be kind of a similar thing uh, for, except for it's, it's your food. All the gross details that you've heard about industrial cattle farming from widespread use of antibiotics and chemicals to animals living in their own feces and being fed parts of other animals they don't naturally consume occurs in the seafood arena arena as well only it is much better hidden. And I put in there as no, as like cool as illegal, but they like bypass the context is, you know, same processes with fish are bypassed used with other industries like beef and pork, um, which really irked me because like I said, it, it went against us, but I see where he's coming from. And, you know, another great one was I had a quote above that. It was a page before talking about how they take things that look like grouper, which is a typical seafood item. And it's just mislabeled purposely because you can get the counterfeit fish for much cheaper, it looks the same. Much cheaper, you can coattail, like you said, lower lower uh, cost of goods for your overhead, getting higher revenues 
by literally like hundreds of percentile. And then you're making out like a bandit, just like I said, a con artist, just with food now. And then what's the repercussions for that? Well, uh, sushi restaurants may accidentally purchase this stuff and use the consumer may accidentally purchase this stuff unbeknownst to either of you. And I am totally now, are there some crooked sushi restaurants out there? Sure. Why not? But let's take it for a grain of salt here and let's assume that they're doing on the right. They've been bamboozled. So have you, and you're the one that gets hurt for it because the next morning you're either on a toilet or you're puking your guts out when you're just hating life because you got something that was not good for you. Your body is not supposed to eat it, but they've undercut the original labeling and everything and it's hit you. And, and that's that one hit uh, close to home on that one too. Well, but in either way there, the, the, the one who is the uh, supplier or uh, not the producer, but the, either the restaurateur, whatever is the one who's going to be responsible for that. And they're going to say, Oh, they, these are a quality sushi maker. They just didn't prepare it right. And so I'm never going back. Sure. Yeah. Instead of instead of being in the in the base case, the fish was bad. I mean, I mean, yeah. either and it surprised me that di- different types of fish that were, you know, substituted. One called what a slime fish. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know, even pay attention to that. I was looking just the concepts, but yeah. Yeah, no, no, and but uh, you know, you got things called hagfish that are just you know, they have these mucous membranes that are just slime that comes off them, and those are those are used, those are supposedly are supposedly being sent to like uh uh some of the asian countries like those but um it doesn't mean that they can't be substituted out for something else the slime fish is something different but um the the ability for them to farm something that is underwater it's not seen you know how is it done what do they put in when can they do it i mean those the the ability to um hormonize um antibiotic guys i mean I'm, I'm making some words up here but the whole thing is 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 very easily done i think because the oversight really is not there i mean even for the casual person you could you could put this stuff in their in their uh raceways or whatever they're they're farming this stuff in in a pipe from a back room and you just pump it in you would never yeah. know what's there and these these fish are living in that so and to hit close to home with us uh a good family friend greg is hawaiian a big part of his culture is fish right and he told us about a probably was it last summer maybe even when he was when they were out um christmas time but he he explained the dangers of farm fisheries right you know salmon and stuff like that and goes i'll never do that because it's so unhealthy and just like i explained in here uh in the intro they, they consume their own waste. They also right. consume other animals that they don't normally consume. And it's so bad for you getting farm raised stuff. And he, uh, Olmstead, I believe talked about that specifically with more of a shrimp than anything. Right. But, um, I was like, wow, didn't think about that with shrimp, but of course it would. Why wouldn't it? Um, so I've been thinking second, third extra times <laughs> when I go to buy shrimp now at the grocery store. Cause like, Oh, nice. do I really want that in my body? But he always said he did, wild caught and fresh caught or whatever it is and and that we already talked about fresh fresh can be right. <laughs> concerning but wild wild uh caught fish that's more important and that made me think as well you know going back to sushi make sure maybe that's your mitigating factor there as long as it's labeled properly uh and hopefully it's not been bypassed the wild caught stuff is where you want to really go with that for your own health well, for now, until somebody else uses that label to uh, do it, he said certain areas, you know, like Alaska. Yeah, Alaska's got no fish farms. It's all it's all naturally caught in the Bering Which Sea. Makes sense. So that was one that's a, a good one. But uh, you know, I've looked at shrimp. But you know, we bought shrimp through the grocery store, and I've looked at it and I've noticed it says product of Malaysia, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I could see that. Well, what he talks about in the book is that, yeah, there's a ton of Chinese farms that, that they, they, they market it through Malaysia. And here's where your they, country they, of origin. They launder it through Malaysia yeah. is what they do. You're, you're washing these fish or laundering these fish out and making yep. them legitimate. And your country of origin labeling now says Malaysia, which we're okay with uh, yep. governmentally and through regulation, which, again, 
listening to him or reading his book and how much money is spent on the regulatory part of that from uh, a trade standpoint is zero. It doesn't yep. happen. So yep. it's window dressing. And and you know what? And when you look at that, we, when we have producers like Kraft Cheese that are making cheese here in the U.S. and they're and they're really scamming what is a real Parmesan cheese in another country. Yeah, you can see now why some of these these trade issues are where they're at with yep. things like our beef. Some yeah, of our and that, I kind of I thought about that too. I was like, you know, we keep thinking Hash Knife Ranch, Montana. Western U.S. That's really our focal point. And in the and if we take our blinders off for a second, it's so much bigger than that. You'd start to get the bigger picture of trade and the right. globe. And you're like, son of a gun. Now I understand why people fight cool because if we're against PDO, protection, right. protected designation designation of origin for like the Europe, and we're we're undercutting that. Of course, like they're gonna say, no, we don't want to abide by your cool standards because you're not even abiding by our standards which are all right. ready in place so right. i i do understand as much as i disagree with it um but to to hit your point home i'll read another quote too uh this was about the fish and and the term organic it goes in both stores and restaurants is routinely labeled organic it falls under the same wild west regulations that existed in meat before the usda created national rules it put to put it simply there are no legal organic rules for seafood at all, but also no rules against using the term. Some companies claim to follow third-party organic standards, some European standards, but it does it doesn't really matter because they don't have to follow any standards and can slap organic label on any seafood, even drug-addled Thai farmed shrimp. So again, yeah. using organic, it's I I put there in there as a note. It's, it has no legitimacy. It's like greenwashing. It is. It, that's exactly yeah. what it is. And, and and who makes that that third party? If if China has a deal with Malaysia, says right. we'll sell you these these bad shrimp. You guys label them as this. Now is now Malaysia is the third party yep. that goes to the U.S. Is like you know it's yeah it's so fraudulent. It's just a matter of what creative way can you come up with to get around the rules, right? And to get around the rules that you know that aren't even enforced, there's there's the other half of that. Yeah, yep. You know, but um, yeah, I mean, and we're but here's the problem, and I, I I'm glad we do what we do. However, it's an uphill battle. You know, when we're oh, yeah. we're trying to make beef that is good, wholesome. You know, all of the things that we've talked about, uh, pasture raised, no hormones, no antibiotics. We do everything that we can to keep that out of a food chain that is not healthy. We don't do yeah. that. I mean, but look at how hard it is and, and what we have to have into it to do it and then labor intensive. You know, how do people know that you get what you get? How do people know that when you get a grouper that's in a South Florida restaurant, how do you know until you stood there and watched them pull that off of a boat that's fresh? Yeah. And they are, I mean, you identify it, what it is. It's harvested right there. They take it in, they cut the filet off of it, and they serve it. We're the same way. And we've always done that where we will, you want, you want this meat? We'll make a video of here it is as a calf. Right. Here it is as a yearling or a weanling and then a yearling. And now we're going to start plan the on doing process. eventually to an extent, but it is. Well, and we'll do that now, but there are some people that say, no, I don't even want to know. I don't want to know mm -hmm. what it looks like, you know, and, and I'm okay with that. They just have a, a you know, the, an attachment that they want to try right. to avoid, especially our, you know, our, our, our friends that love, love dogs and cats. Right. Um, you know, they, they would, they love to eat stuff, but they don't know, want to know what it looks like where, you know, you kind of get desensitized by that. But the whole point of, of, of this is, that we have the ability to do that. And a lot of people don't want that. Don't want that even people asking about, oh, can yeah. I see what it is? Because right. they do have something to hide. Yeah. Or and we're, we've we always been on the forefront. And that's kind of the other part of my monologue was the quality producers in the world, they're the ones fighting for more labeling. Yep. If you hear somebody say, I want more on this label, I want more information so the producer or the consumer knows what's being produced, what's been put into it. It's not the people that have anything to hide. 
it's the it's the people that have been producing and they're like let's go let's let's show them what we put in here let's what let's show them what we have not put in here because that's really where people are wanting to find things but and then there goes the crux of the, of the whole book by larry olmstead and that is yeah. go ahead and make your label now i'm gonna make it made in montana kind of yeah exactly right in little fine print on the outside of the label uh, that that makes it look like it's part of and you make it shaped like mountains and it says kind of now you're right back to the same thing i i and i think as as long as and i can't well, remember what the product well, it's was the, that it's they also made the vi- it, it's the opposite argument too is you know i put in there at the very beginning a family run ranch right well by technicality that's not true we're an llc we're we're a big corporation by by standards of legal you know and when people make that argument they're like oh you're part of the big uh big ag and stuff and like you could say that about 92% of people because 92% of agriculture is family run, but right. because it might be under a, a, a hash knife ranch LLC or uh, a bar X company, or because there's something like that, it's no longer considered family owned. It's a company and it's now big egg according to people who don't know better. Well, yeah, except that we don't have uh, a, a, a board of directors and investors that we answer to. We are them. We, yeah. that, you know, that's that's the difference uh but and i think most of them most groups uh family owned businesses are llc's or sub corps Something purely like for the taxation issues that we have right you have some you know protections that way and continuity uh, liability stuff i mean it's 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 what it is it's that's the way we're at in our in our lifestyle now uh as a culture so um but but yeah as long as I started to say, I can't remember what the product was that was made inexpensively enough that there's no, it, it, you can, the chances of you getting the real product are almost a hundred percent because they don't have the markup where fraudulent type of um, coat tailors are not going to spend the money to make it because it does, there's no real profit in it. I can't remember what the heck it was in that book. I don't know. But it was a good, remember. it was a very good point to it uh, that, you know, those things that are, are made very efficiently with little overhead or, or, or little profit margin overall for the entire industry is um, relatively safe as far as what you're going to get and, and knowing what you're going to get. And I can't remember what the heck it was. And I should have taken a note on it. Yeah, I don't but remember that I, either. I, I might have happened to gloss over it on accident because I would have thought that I remember that as well. Well, and I'm surprised you glossed over things because you had probably 200 sticky notes in this book. You have, do you even have the book to show them? Uh, it's notes. upstairs. I got it upstairs. Uh, I, but... Yeah, that's, that's how I read. Um, I got sticky notes all over my books of people. I don't write my books. I write on sticky notes because I don't. I will never deface my beautiful books. So I put <laughs> sticky notes all over. They're also easy references. So if you're looking for yeah. a reference, you can grab them and pull it open. Yeah. Uh, but kind of with the labels, it, it talked about, uh, I have two, a, a horrible example as to how exa- uh, labels are uh, taken advantage of. And then a good example. Uh, we'll find out. Mm. I was happy. I was happy about the good example. The bad example was uh, uh, they're talking about 100% Pinot Noir in oregon that might be as good or better than one from burgundy but will never be the same even if you're using identical vines that that's literally a quote that i pulled right here um and he just talked about the same thing of you know using those labels i'm making wine in oregon but it's not in burgundy so you can't say it's burgundy wine right. you, I'm, I'm not in champagne i can't call this champagne even though it's in california same with the cheese and so on and so forth and he goes uh with three different models just as Cadillac is a brand of car, Cadillac can legally protect its name, but cannot claim an automotive automobile exclusive. Right. Okay. I can't claim a, a wine exclusive, but I can say, Hey, you can't use my name. I can do that with a car. Why can't I use that with food? And people will be like, well, cars, you know, it's a luxury item. Technically I, I don't necessarily need a car, but I need food. I'm like, nah, I see where your point is, but I disagree respectfully. Um, labels are important. And just because you're trying to make or mimic something that's made and well-known in another part of the world does not mean that you get to try and take advantage of said word and label. Like that's not right. 
first like go back to ethics legally yeah can you but should you <laughs> now my favorite good point was uh scotch whiskey believe it or not the ones that have it figured out is scotch um you cannot legally say i have a scotch whiskey here unless it's been made in scotland right i i can't be in japan I can't be in Malaysia. I can't be in Uganda. I can't be in Egypt. I can't be in the United States. It's got to be Scotland, baby. Uh, what a fantastic... And those guys have been fighting and fighting and fighting. And they've been winning every time in the yeah. EU, the world markets. And nobody can touch the name Scotch. Proud of them. Congratulations. That's what we should all be going for. Because guess what? When people say, I got a 10-year-old Scotch, like, oh, what label? Because you know it's from Scotland. Now you're just wondering... Right. Is it the distillery I enjoy or is it something that's just something I've never had or something I'm just not interested at all? But, you know, it's scotch. Well, and that brought up an interesting thing that I'd never given much thought to. And that was what they called the uh, geographic indicators. You know, yeah. uh, you talked you talked about the uh, uh, Bordeaux. Yeah. That's a ge ge geographic indicator. Uh, Champagne from France. Those are both French in a certain region of France. Yep. Roquefort cheese, the same way. Kobe beef, that part of Japan. Uh, it's a geographic indicator that only comes from that spot. And that's also used as part of your labeling, or could be. Uh, so something else to be kind of aware of when you know where something should be, but it's not there, you know, product of wherever else when it's, when it's not there, you know you've got a fake. But right. uh, scotch the same way. That's a geographic indicator. And I never gave that a thought as far as, yes, we know that, uh, that it only comes from these areas. Real stuff only comes from that. But as far as a legal, um, you know, inner, inner uh, trade type of uh, possible embargoes, um, tariffs, that kind of stuff that, that goes along with that. And it makes total sense, uh, which is just another way of, it's another way of labeling, but it's a, a de more defensible. I guess one, well, I think also it's interesting too. If, if anybody's in, if anybody knows anything about whiskey, um, you can say with most certainty, you can say the same about Irish. You know, I've got a couple Irishes at home. Oh, what do you have? Normally they're going to say, Oh, okay. It's, it's an Irish whiskey. Is that always the case? No, but I think it's also because of proximity to Scotland and because Scotland has done a fantastic job of setting the example of protecting their label that most people kind of synonymously think Ireland with Irish. I, I don't know if, if they're, if they have a struggle with it, cause that wasn't in here. I would love to know if uh, Ireland does or, or not, but two very distinct tasting whiskeys. They're not similar whatsoever. If you had one next to the other, you would know one's a scotch and one's an Irish, but, um, I think kind of the same thing though is that that synonymousness with it. Same with like bourbon. We can we do the same thing. Bourbon is American made, or at least it's supposed to, but it has been stepped on a couple of times by like Japanese whiskeys, stuff like that. So you'll have like a uh Japanese bourbon is what it'll be like labeled. So kind of the same thing. They've stepped into that arena trying to change it, but the only ones that have really held strong with it, it's been the Scottish government and oh those are my people. <laughs> yeah. Well, you <laughs> got to admire important. that, but what, at what cost, you know, you don't, what yeah. you don't know is how many people have gone out of business, how many people oh, yeah. were destroyed, ruined, yeah. uh, ended up working for somebody because they couldn't hold on because of it. I mean, there's your American, uh, beef industry right there and not just beef. I mean, we're talking all facets of agriculture, whether you're, whether you're a farmer, uh, raising chickens hogs uh you name it it's it's the same it's there's there's an attack on it because of um you know I, and i think it's more political than anything between countries and and you know some of our our trade uh policies i guess but another thing too is to understand for some people it's not just an overnight thing uh scotch no. has been around for hundreds of years before right. bourbon ever was and it wasn't until they got the Scotch Whiskey Act of 1988. I mean, we're talking 30 years ago, 35 recent. years ago. And then yeah. the most recent one that they had was in 2009. They reinforced it. They reinforced the act with the Scotch Whiskey Regulations. And that's all from the United Kingdom uh, Parliament. 
So, I mean, that's just a local governance to an extent, and that's not an international body whatsoever. So that's crazy that hundreds of years, probably I would, I would guess to say maybe a thousand or more, <laughs> uh, it took that long to get something in writing saying, no, you're not going to touch our label. Uh, okay. Which is crazy. But, the, but, but that's, but here's the thing about that. If you're, if you're doing something fraudulently and you put that on there, you're going to still do that for a while until you get caught. Yeah. And then you just quit doing it. What are the teeth behind that? So labeling's great. I wish we can do it in the, in the, in the short answer to, okay, how come, how come I can read a label and not necessarily know it's right. We struggle with the same thing. The whole yeah. portion of that again is come and come take a look. We will show you. And you know what? And I'm, and I'm probably the worst one about this. I don't believe anything I see anymore. No, I'm getting that point too. You know, because you can manipulate things uh, to be whatever you want it to be. I mean, it's, it's, it's just insane. It used to be, but my, my dad would say, don't believe anything you hear and only half of what you see. Well, hell, you can't even believe anything you see anymore. And yep. hearing something, forget it. You know, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's a sad state, but at the same time, labeling is only going to, um, work for a short time or only as long as you can enforce that. Yeah, well, and, and that's that's where I wanted to go next for a second was you, you talked about the enforcement. I'm glad you said that because they talked about in the well, Olmsted pointed out in the book, there were I think it was winemakers in California that they came together. Let me see if I can find that real quick. They they came together to do something about uh, labels. In fact, yeah. like making sure that they they abided by the fact that they were going to label properly, if I remember right. correctly. Yes. Um, but here we go. Yeah, let me. Here's a quote. In 2005, representatives from major wine regions around the world gathered in the Napa Valley to j sign the Joint Declaration to Protect Wine Place Names and Origin, JDPWPNO. Uh, winemakers worldwide know that when it comes to wine, location matters. The integrity of wine places, the integrity of wine place names is fundamental tool for consumers to identify wines of great wine growing regions. And I put in there uh yes for wine, no for beef. Cool. That was my notes. Um, it's symbolic, but like I said, uh, it's a symbolic gesture that has no legal backing. There's no, you know, it's interesting to find that the wine wine world wants to solidify that and, and, and confirm it and make it better. But there's no teeth to hide behind that. That's just a regulation. That's or that's a that's a self governance that you should have been abiding by in the first place. And because a few select people have decided that they will do so, does not mean that the rest of the world will either. Well, but the part of, part of that is I don't think that would have probably came about until uh, the California wines uh, bested. You're right. The Good French point. wines in yep. right two yep. years in two years in a row it was the same guy that was a, it was a, it was a stunt in order to really uh, rise the French wines up to, again, be the best in the world. And they had a bunch of winemakers or wine tasters, uh, world-renowned, that um, tasted these wines, and the Californians whipped them. Well, they did it again, and they whipped them again on these, on these right. blind, as they should be, taste tests. So it makes me wonder if, okay, now that we're top of the world and we've got our own geographic indicator – as a California wine, maybe yeah. we should ought to start uh, having some some agreement there because really it's protectionism on their part. <laughs> Before that, right. what were they doing? They were trying to mimic, you know, wines from France. Exactly. No, they were trying to mimic, and now oh, now they're better. Now, now they're they better. Want to try and, now protect. they want to protect themselves. Okay. Now there was there was one thing. Uh, uh, you know, I can remember advertisements for Ernest and Julio Gallo and. Uh, you know, all of their wines were fantastic and they, they have such care. Well, really, according to Olmsted, these guys were kind of fraudged. You know, they were just not making what they should have been making. They yeah. were calling it one thing when it really wasn't uh, and, and, and marketing and selling it and still are. But uh, was it Robert Mondavi and the group? They decided to come up with a, a style of wine. Oh, okay. And market that. Now I'm okay with that in a way, partially in a way, um, because the same thing happens with the horse breeds. 
horse breeds change over time. And we've talked about this as well, where somebody decides, you know what? I want to cross uh, this color and with this kind of animal, and I'm going to call it my family name. And that happened right here in Montana. Uh, a guy was trying to market a, a walking horse and call it a Montana uh, horse. Uh, visited with a guy, knew the guy, actually bred to one, his stud. And the product was not what it should have been. It, the horses that I saw and many people that, that uh, had either bred to a stallion, uh, these horses really did not walk. But he was trying to build his own breed. And the right. same thing happened in here. You capitalize off of something for a while and, and try to make your own um, uh, type of niche market, which is fine if it works. And, if, and, and you're up board and above board and say, yeah, this is what I've done and this is what I'm calling it. I don't have that much of a problem with that as long as you're honest about what you're putting together and what you're trying to accomplish and, and doing it. And if it's successful, okay, good for you. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, uh, and those winemakers were doing the same thing. They, they took two words uh, like majestic and something else uh, and put them together for this type of wine. Um, I'm sorry, but they were, they're making their own. Uh, it's, it's that type of wine that they are they are marketing and Mondavi was one of the guys involved with it there was about five different ones that were were doing these type of wines and I think I remember yeah now yeah I, and now and I... you know what it's and, and they're successful at it it's like okay but it's they're really trying to do a again it's more of a geographic indicator with a process kind of combining yeah. the two of them yeah uh we'll move on to industrialization the other part was uh, the mass production, which we've, we've hit on a little bit. So I'll try and maybe keep this one a little bit short, uh, you know, just picking up the like oils and stuff, picking up the wrong stuff, the things that are just overripe or not ripe enough, so on and so forth. Um, he talked about uh, two things here. The easiest way to harvest cheaply and get the highest yield is to simply do what we said, pick things up off the ground. It's not good, even though it's rotten. Uh, high, and I put as a note, it's a higher yield, but lower quality, right? And so out of the convenience of the, producer it gouges the consumer well and, and, then and there's a there's a saying for that in in the uh in the oil industry when you've got something that's bad yeah and you want to get rid of it it's 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 not desirable call it pollution the solution to pollution is, is dilution, dilution. Mm, interesting same thing in everything else you saw that in your olive oils and your wines yep yeah that's exactly what happened uh Another thing, you know, he's, he goes, artisanal producers uh, bottle the product on their own estates. Most olive oil is put not into bottles, but rather trucks or tankers. Well, what's left is residue in those tankers. You know, maybe that sub-quality stuff. Maybe they've already got half the tanker filled with somebody else's lower quality product and you put a high quality product in there. Well, it's now just been, your high quality has been diluted. Their low quality has also been diluted. So you're still not getting high quality stuff, but you know, it talks about endless examples of tainted, adulterated, and illegally refined oils being delivered surreptitiously to the biggest bottlers and ending up in the products they sell. And then, well, and that happens in 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 our uh, processing or like candies. Yeah, they get tanker loads of different things. They may get pure syrup, they may get uh, mm -hmm. corn syrups, and right. they empty a tanker out. Well, they can't completely clean it or they don't take the time to completely clean it because that's expensive and time consuming. So they they load on top of that. So in the labeling, it say may contain corn syrups or all these different things because it's it's being diluted out. It's right. not necessarily what they want, but they got to say it's in there because it is. You don't necessarily have a, a designated tanker, so it's going to have yeah. potential. Yeah. Right. Um, and we'll kind of. Before I get to the point I have highlight up on the screen, I'll put one more quote and talks more about the beef. His quote here was, it pains me when I go to buy real beef, truly natural, grass finished and chemical free. And it costs dearly while right next to it is the industrial version for a third of the price. That's a big difference. And not everyone can afford a good steak. Well, well, like I said, it, you're going to use up more land if you want grass finished, grass fed, grass finished, right? Because you're not going to put grain to them. Uh, you're also you're forcing to wait for somebody to take care of it the proper way in that sense. And, and what are, what we would consider you're, you're going to have more of like the, 
they're artisanal, <laughs> the, the hands-on approach to that, because mm-hmm. you're going to get what you want. And because of that, it's going to cost more. It's going to take more time. It's going to take more land. It's going to take more resources to produce that. And that's where kind of that industrialization thing was is we can mass produce beef 21 and a half percent based off of 2022 statistics for the world. 21 and a half percent. Or you can cut it to probably closer to 12 percent and we can do all grass fed grass finished beef. And people all want to have that, but it's not going to be as flavorful either. So what exactly do you want? You know, So you got to figure out where your where your. You know, preferences are, I guess. Well, and and to that point, we're, we're we still do that. We fall into that uh, structure, whether or not we're going to grass fatten something only, yeah. and that's what they get as a finished product, or we take that animal doing the same process. They're out on pasture, they're eating grass, and we bring them in and we allow them to eat more grass, and then we hand feed them twice a day. I mean, that's yeah. what we do. That's our processes. So uh, for us, it's cheaper ultimately to to have a grass finished completely grass finished with no with no grain and less intensive than it is to do a grain finished but you still as you say as you point out you have that animal on grass much longer which takes up yeah. space where something else could be growing in time and, and sold off as a as a six month old seven month old well and, and a quick answer to that too he's got because i was about to go to farm to table stuff after this but uh, he puts, so why aren't we eating more grass-fed beef? The simple answer is money. It costs an additional 17% extra to raise beef on grass than grain, according to USDA documents. Packing cows into indoor feedlots and forcing them to eat silage is cheaper. You know, that mass production, you know, you're giving them stuff that you can just put out to 100 cows at one time. You know, it's 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 the quickness and efficiency of it. One person can go out there with a bunch of silage and feed 200 cows in one quick spurt and then pick up feed, feed another 200 cows and do that time and time again all day long and right. gets them the nutrients they need and they're not going to be moving around a lot using up that uh, that now, weight either. Now, I'm, one of the things I'm going to say on this was that I thought he was a little bit off on and maybe not as informed, which made me wonder about his information on everything else, is he was talking about, uh, he made the statement that feedlots when these cattle are brought in and, and under a roof in a feedlot, I've never seen such a thing. I um, So I think there's some, because uh, I, with the ind- the issues we have had with the drought the last couple of years, there are some feedlots with roofs, but that's more or less for shading in the right. summertime. That's Correct. not for overall protection from the environment. That's, that's, right. that's to take, because black, like again, we've talked about this before, black Angus, has done such a great job of marketing. So everybody yep. has a black Angus practically. And so those cows get overheated in the uh, summertime. They need shade. And that's really, I think that's where I've seen overheads, but that's pretty much it. Yeah. and But that was the thing is it was a little bit misleading that it wasn't for the shade. It made it sound like it was part of the, the, the production to gain weight. And it is basically to keep from losing weight. Yeah. A different issue. But I, so I, I kind of took a little bit of an issue of being absolutely honest or whether he knew the reason why. And, I, and yeah. I'm kind of guessing not. Right. He probably didn't. But at the same time, like you're talking, he he discussed a dozen foods. Yeah. So at some point, you're not going to have 100% nailed on facts. I, I expect that. You know, if he talked about the beef industry solely, I'd be like, all right, dude, you're you've just kind of you've discredited yourself but the fact that he used it to equate to other different industries i i really didn't take too much fault with that well and and i guess my point to that was it was getting very detailed much more detailed than he had in in Mm -hmm. some of the other things yeah that's true so i I mean it was but but i i I, and i did i looked past that too but i wanted to i wanted to point that out but not everything that was absolutely there was that from my perspective, knowing that, I don't know anything about the olive oil industry, the cheese no. stuff, other than, you know, I'll, I'll try to eat it. Well, and just the last point of the industrialization part is the fact that sometimes it's cheaper to add the less quality stuff. Like we talked about the oils right. and everything, but you also ta- talked about with the cheeses, you know, 7.8% of edible things that are fillers. It's not necessarily good for your body, but they put it in there. And that's that's a, that's a worrisome too, because uh, what else is edible that may not be good for your body? as well right right um all right moving to the next point here we've got farm to table stuff so 
I had I thought he had a couple great examples that were kind of anecdotes in there about what I shared in the the monologue about the eating. I think he was in uh, Chile when they had that crab, and then also the I think it was a grouper fillet uh, in Florida. Uh, those were fantastic. And Sam, my internet connection is unstable. I don't know why. Uh, we'll see how this goes. All right, but um, you know the farm to table stuff. I I just thought the the fact that that store owner for the the Florida grill he could tr- he said I can trace every single fish from the moment it is caught until we serve it and then it goes that's why Frenchies is the only place I will eat grouper I think that's fantastic uh then I already shared that anecdote but then there was another one here that uh oh I shared this too the, the Italian thing he said Americans come back from vacation in Italy and wonder as an ev- in as inevitably do, why even the simplest dishes taste so much better? And he goes, well, essentially, real food's better, man. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and he kind of tied it up with his conclusion at the end of the book about that, which uh, we'll try and get to a little bit here. But I I thought that was fantastic. Just the fact that you when you have real foods that you take from the garden and whatnot, and it doesn't have preservatives or anything added to it, it allows all the true flavor to come out, and that's what people covet the most. And Yet we want the mass industrialization and it results in less fresh food, less farm to table, less sea or, or fish, uh, uh, fish catching, I guess, fishing to table, you know, <laughs> like that's where I'm kind of right. going with is, is that fresh food makes it so much better. Well, it's about convenience too. I mean, if you, if it's easy to yeah. get, um, then it's, you know, there's not been a lot or as much put into the effort to make it perhaps. Uh, so that's, you know, kind of taken for granted that that can happen. I, I, it made me wonder, you know, we talk about processing all the time and the fast foods and how the health effects of fast foods are and kind of tying in the large uh, deal of this up is, you know, you've got some of the, like McDonald's doing the, the beyond burgers or the fake meat, um, how healthy is that with people who have that kind of a diet versus yeah. what, you know, when I was a kid, we had a, we had a garden, a large garden. And I can remember my, my great aunt and uncle coming to visit. Maybe I've said this before. And we were out picking some peas for an evening meal. We we're going to have some baby potatoes and peas. And we put, were picking the peas when they showed up, they kind of helped us pick some more peas. We sat in the house or maybe we're out in the yard. I don't remember. Anyway, we're shelling peas, literally shelling the peas. And we uh, went and, and and dug up some baby potatoes, fixed those in real time in that moment for supper. And they were sitting there. And to me, it was like, well, this is what we do. Yeah. And they're like, oh, my God, when's the last time you had it? The taste. And I and I go back to that at times like that is fresh. That's real food. That's fresh food. That is you know, literally from the garden to your table within, you know, minutes, uh, an hour on the outside. And the difference in the health benefits and the taste and the overall experience, you, I, you really can't count experience. We all got to eat, but sometimes we eat differently because we don't know any different than what we've been already consuming. And and stretching out there and finding something like that is, I think, part of his his uh, his point to that book is you don't necessarily know what something really tastes like or what it really is. And that experience is part of that. Yeah. I, yeah, that, that's a good point, but it, I can't help with you, especially with your example, going back to what Americans termed as victory gardens in world war two, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. it, it was kind of an adage back to Jefferson's yeoman farmer, but those who could, you know, go, go make a, even if it's small, make a small garden in your backyard. And they did, they, you know, they did what they could to make a compost and then, you know, make, make minimum things work because those who at the home front, if they could spare something here and there, hopefully it would help the soldiers in Europe or the soldiers in Japan. That was kind of the idea. And they ate from the back of the, the, those little gardens, even if it was minor, they ate from those. And when everybody came home from World War II, everything became more industrialized, got more suburbs, people going to factories and so on. 
And then you started slowly getting the TV dinners, which makes it me think, you know, if you were to go back to a lifestyle like that, maybe we would have less of the TV dinners, the fast food stuff and more of the wholesome stuff, because you never had anybody talking about farm to table, farm, uh, farm to restaurant type stuff until just a couple last couple of years. Right. And it's like it to an extent, it's kind of an adage back to un, un, unbeknownst to a lot of people, because a lot of people don't know their history in terms of that. But. Uh, it's kind of an adage back to those victory gardens and that that experience that you're sharing too of those people coming and visiting and they try and go man when was the last time you had this you know right. it's just it's that freshness right. um i'll kind of finish with this for the farm to table because a lot of the stuff we're starting to cover we've already discussed so we're i don't want to beat a dead horse here but um this is a long quote but uh, the gist of it was in 2024 or sorry 2014 they had a, a leading culinary website called Serious Eats uh, did a series of, of taste tests to find the best tasting Parmesan. And, you know, and he went through it and they go, you know, they 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 had all these cheeses lined up. Everybody tasted them. And uh, as reported, this guy goes, maybe it seems wrong to have imported Parmigiano Reggiano. If I say that right, I hope so. Um, to win the best taste, but in good conscience it doesn't make sense because ultimately the stuff that was from uh italy the 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 correctly produced if you want to say the the quality produced the small amounts in the world that are actually parmesan they won blind taste tests and everything the the traditionally made parmesan won, not the parmesan like not the craft created or anything like that it goes you know, you just can't beat the quality of the real stuff. And so my context was, you know, truly good products are not needed to be changed. Sometimes even the best stuff is better priced anyway, because they said some of the stuff that was fake about it was being overpriced than the original Parmesan too sometimes. So you just got to look and find that right label, I guess. Well, and you know what, what, when I, I read that passage in, in there and I thought to myself, when it was kind of leading up to this taste test, I thought, oh crap, you know, what's going to happen is if, the real stuff's going to lose out because yeah. we become accustomed to a certain palate taste and anticipation yeah. of what it should be when it really isn't what it is. And looking and, for that savory, that chemically made savory context. Yeah. 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 You, you begin to like that almost. It's, it's almost uh, like the, um, oh, what do I always say? Your, your mother, uh, when she took me into captivity, that I Stockholm suffer, syndrome. I suffer from the Stockholm syndrome, and it's almost like the same thing of that, that. That you are so accustomed to something that's not good for you because that's all you've ever had. That's yeah. what you want, and that's yeah. what you expect. So it's. I it's, I kind of thought the same thing. So to hear that it was, yeah. it actually tends to be cheaper or on the yep. cheaper side, and then it still won out. I was like, yeah, there you go. <laughs> the yeah, yeah. No, that's that that was that was a that was a good part to that. So, um. Very interesting read. I, I told your mom, I said, you need to read this book. Uh, I wasn't wild about reading it, but when I yeah, was especially because to me, I was like, this is just going to be a weird self-help book. I'm not interested in it. It just, yeah. I had no inclination, but somebody suggested I needed to read it. So I did. I was like, Ooh, we're talking about this. <laughs> well, you know, don't, don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it comes in once again, but no, I was, I was very uh, intrigued by the book and I, I think I read that thing in like, I don't know, three different sessions. I mean, I, I blazed through it. It was, yeah. it was interesting yeah. enough that I didn't want to quit reading. Yeah. i once I started getting going, yeah, I kind of drug my feet a little bit, but uh, let's do a segue real quick into uh, plant-based proteins as well as say, and ethics real quick um, before we wrap this puppy up. But uh, what did you think about the plant-based what was it? We had Beyond. Oh, Impossible Burger. There you go. Impossible Burger. There you I go. Had, I had Impossible Burger here in Kentucky by myself, but we had the Beyond Meat patties together, right? I think we did. Yep. I don't have that. We did the Beyond Meat patties. Um, I know we kind of explained some on the, the video, but just kind of a reminder, what what do you think about that stuff? And That's nasty. Um, yeah. but it, it, but I've had it before. I mean, I've had that in, um, ca either cafeteria type food or, uh, yeah. concession type food. You can, 
you taste that that filler or that and i i always attributed it to soy it, was, it, sound, it tastes like soy meat sure. or soy burger and it, it probably and there's like a film on your mouth too when you eat it honestly mm-hmm. people may say you're crazy They're like no it no. if you think like a because 80 80 20 and maybe that's why too is 80 20 percent beef to fat so 80 percent beef 20 percent fat when they do that a lot of times you'll kind of get a film on your mouth too from the fattiness mm-hmm. because we noticed when looking into the meat a little bit more they do try to replicate the 80 20 it, it almost makes it makes me wonder if they try and use that as an excuse for the film to your mouth okay. i don't know it's me just being probably ultra skeptical <laughs> well <laughs> and and, meat, and but... why why do why do a lot of burger places why do they have the 80 20 what's the point of that well it's twofold one yeah. fat's cheaper than meat you know it's right. it's like its own organic or natural filler it does yeah. make a juicier burger and and those burgers will hold together on a grill um, what we tend to build when we, when we butcher an animal and make burger is a 90, 10. Yeah. And we've even done 93 and 7%, which is a little bit, it doesn't quite hold together as well, but the, the 90, 10 is probably utilized more is it still, it still has plenty of juice in it. It's, it's, it's moist. Cause you're not cooking it to death. And that's part of what we don't do is 90, 10 cook. tends to be the, the mix, the hamburger mix people will get if they do a direct consumer sale. A lot, yeah. Uh, it's not normally 80-20. I've I've looked around. A lot of people sell. I think it's both efficiency and just uh the processors probably. It typically I w- I would guard I'd go out on a limb and say probably 85% or more of sales are 90-10 for a direct consumer sale. Yeah, I, I don't burger. know. I well, but when you're doing a direct consumer sale, you're also customizing what you want as well. You are. So yeah, that's you a good know, but point. I, I think a lot of them are 85%, 15% in the stores you see that a lot but anyway um when you when you when you drop that down what we've noticed and what your mom really likes when she cooks something say chili or yeah. or something that's a, a burger mix is it spaghetti sauce that you're not removing a bunch of fat right yeah that's the biggest you get enough that it doesn't burn but you're not you know losing a bunch of this in rendering down the fat that's in the burger right. and it's still not super um kind of scummy on the noodles right. and stuff like that either right yeah. so that that fat content there but on, on your on that beyond meat or beyond burger that we had was like yeah i i mean i've been damned hungry where i'll eat about anything but and and i've never complained about having something especially when i'm hungry but you know that is one of the last things i would grab to to try to stave off some hunger well and, just, and having it just doesn't taste good it doesn't taste healthy to me Eating that compared to the impossible burger I had, because, you know, I, I remember you guys saying that you're kind of good looking for the cheaper stuff. I'm like, okay. So right. I decided to go on my own and get the more expensive stuff. The, right. the, the things that people are kind of more in, inclined to get, because I think also name recognition, because the impossible yeah. burger has been kind of one of the first ones out there, not right. just beyond burger, but the, the impossible burger. So I tried that one. And the biggest difference I had was, uh, first off, my body reaction to it, because you remember I, if this might be too much information for some people, but I, I smelled horrible because mom and dad took a quarter of one patty each and I ate the other patty and a half. And that was the only difference in our diets that day. And the next day, my stomach was hurting. Um, I went to the bathroom a few extra times and I smelled horrible. I really did. And then the impossible burger, I'll tell you, I did not have that same experience. Hmm. But also when I did taste it, um, the, the taste was, there wasn't much flavor like, like the beyond burger. It was the same in terms of that. But when I ate it, I remember the, the, the beyond burger, there was, I kind of felt like chunks in there almost like, uh, I think I said in the video, it almost tastes like the meaty part of a sunflower seed at times right. had been cooked in, you know, it, it just kind of felt like there was kind of a hunk like that. And there, it was very edible or, and easy to eat, but I could feel the chunks like that throughout it. Um, almost like it hadn't been refined down as well, mm. but the impossible burger, it, it it's meatiness was much more similar to beef where it's been really ground up. So it makes me think, you know, maybe they've spent more time grinding it up and maybe, maybe they've put other stuff in there. Maybe they've done something special to it, but those were kind of the two big differences. was my, my body's reaction and the way it, it kind of felt in your mouth too, with the, the meaty, uh, texture. Yeah. And I, and I was expecting it looked 
the 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 Beyond Burger that we had here at the ranch, it looked horrible. It was gray, nasty yeah. looking. Um, but honestly, it, it it didn't taste great. It was nasty, but it didn't taste as bad as I thought it was going to taste. No, I was pleasantly Still surprised bad. at that one. Still bad, but it wasn't as bad as I thought. You know, I yeah. I, I kind of had visions of not being able to chew it and get it down, but no, it was it was edible. It very it very much was. Um. All right. Next one, and the last one, folks. If you've stuck around with us this long, <laughs> ethics and food. Um, I I been taking this class i'm almost done with it and it's been a good class but um i was reading a chapter intro and it really captured my attention while i was making this and maybe it's because you know you drive a certain car you start to see the car everywhere um i i don't know but i think maybe that and just the fact that it really caught my attention but it said you know those things that kind of laid out was labels uh targeting kids the label the level at which they're at so that you can still again target the kids in terms of what they see um kind of seeing things like juices where there might be tropical fruits like let's say dragon fruit pineapple and mangoes but there's nothing in the item that's being shown that's anything relating to that um another thing is uh actually going back to i think our book was it said a lot of cranberry juice has apple in it right you know so there's kind of some fraudulence there and then also just in terms of you're you're selling it for the sake of selling it rather than what's actually there so to speak um well, i've also talked about that, but on social media don't they call that clickbait ain't that kind of really the sure. same thing in real life yeah i think so that that'd probably be a pretty accurate analogy to that right yeah but th- then they also, you know, I I looked on there and it said uh, in this intro, I talked about like the increase of size and calories, you know, portion sizes have increased in restaurants for the past 30 years. And it's not only in physical size, but also calories and nutrients. You know, your, your coffees are no longer maybe a hundred calories. Maybe they're 350 calories for a small, <laughs> you know, and, and maybe your sandwich isn't what you would have been normally uh, 30 years ago at 350 calories. Now it's maybe 700, you know, you're, you're pushing the limits there and you're maxing out people's intakes for maybe it's not very much protein, but there's a lot of fats and a lot of carbohydrates in that. And it's overloading your system. Uh, the packaging products kind of looks healthier. Um, and, and that this is where it came with the, the one that I really want to talk about was green labels due to perception with good being green over red. And then it kind of took me to where, well, where's red meat? You know, red is, you know, maybe you're saying red meat and maybe that's part of the problem too, is you say red meat and people think bad because it's red, you know, greens, you say, Hey, get your greens. And you're thinking veggies. Well, you know, maybe your veggies aren't always good, but your red meat is good too. You know, it just, it made me kind of go down that for a second. And then it said, uh, finally, you know, obesity is now one in five in children and one in three in adults. Uh, so these are all concerns. I think they all very much deal with ethics it goes back to labeling you know just because you can legally do it should you um and and things like that so that's why i kind of wanted to end with that i have i think if you're going to raise things ethically you're going to raise animals ethically you should produce products ethically and you should imply or uh you should deploy ethics appropriately when you are providing anything to somebody who would be a consumer whether that's in the food industry, the drink industry, the clothing industry, I think ethics are, they're important. Well, but I think that, I think that again, there's a justification that takes place that when you, when you claim something or when you show a picture of something on a label and it's not really in there. Yeah. Is that marketing or is it non-ethics? Right. I, I mean, it, it depends. It really depends. Cause I mean, just because I'm getting a beer at the end of the day, doesn't mean I'm getting a bikini clad babe also, you know? <laughs> well, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Cause you I got was... girls out there with the Budweiser beer and a bikini right. for a Super Bowl commercial. It doesn't mean I'm getting her with the beer. No, you know? I know. But the, but the implication is if I'm in the same room, I l- at least get a look at her. Sure. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Right. I mean, I mean, how far, where, how, where do you want to play that at? But it's the same, yeah. it's the same reason why the, the, uh, cereal boxes that are, have bright colors 
yeah. are at the eye level of a little kid sitting in a store cart. Sure. Same reason. It's marketing. Is that ethical? Right. Well, and that's another know. question too, is you're now you're now you're manipulating children. You know, where where does it come to when you can't you know what what age can you start manipulating the consumer? Because we're all manipulated in some way, shape, or form when it comes to sure advertisements. But right. what form, you know, should we be targeting the 18 and up? Or should we be targeting 15 and up? Should we be targeting 12 and up? Should we be targeting six and up? You know, well, where where does it start? Where, we're where are we allowed? Arg- you currently have that argument with cigarettes and va- and vaping. Sure. Yeah. You know, they quit. I, I remember when uh, television had commercials for cigarettes. Yeah. And that quit, you know, so uh, vaping the same way. Uh, there's all kinds of, you know, uh, regulatory stuff. But one of the things that you cannot do, and I was told this years ago, and it has always held true, is you cannot regulate morality. Yeah, no, you're absolutely great. And I think that's where it really goes to the direct consumer for beef when it comes coming back home here. People know who we are. They know what they're going to get. They don't know what, what exactly, because also country of origin labeling, but they don't know who or what produced the beef that's on the on the uh, grocery store shelf right. so you know it comes to that too you know and i think that's also part you know with, with a lot of things that have happened the last couple of years maybe that's why some people are they're they're starting to look more and more at direct consumer sales too because they want to know who it is because they trust less right. and less of what's going going back to the beyond meat and impossible murder and stuff like that I don't know what you're putting in there. You could tell me and you could be telling me the truth, but how do I know you're telling me the right. truth? You know, you can't label truth. You can't label morality like you're saying. One of the things that happens when we sell a beef uh, to someone right from us to them, or we even do our own, what does it say on the package? Not for resale. Oh yeah. 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 In in red stamped letters, not for resale. Yeah. Not for resale. It is only to that consumer directly from us through yeah. the butcher which means they could give it as a gift to a family member but they can't sell it that's illegal. can't sell it yeah we're not and we're not we're not selling it to somebody else but that's those are regulatory things and not that we do but is done by the state and the and the inspectors that it can't be resold to the general public great it, all we'd have to do is have it inspected and we could do it but we choose to do that directly to the people and at some point we may do both who knows yeah. but for sure, you know you're getting directly from us and what we're producing. Right. So yeah. with those thoughts, let that uh, percolate a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, the payoff is for you when you buy our beef, you get what you get. And you get what we show you it is. And uh, you don't get anything else except for a thank you till you're better paid.